Hi everyone, my name's TSW, and in this video I'm going to be going through how to heal Karazhan pre-nerf. So if you don't know who I am, I predominantly play Warrior Tank. I've played basically every pre-nerf private server there has been. I've been playing private TBC for about 8 years, and I played back in the day as well. We're going to go through with a healer point of view, my friend and guildy Adal. He's a really good priest, and he sat down with me and I asked him, how do you specifically heal Karazhan? Because I main a protection warrior, so everything tanking I'm very confident with. But for healing, like there were some things that I learnt, and I've done Kara about 200 times on the previous servers I've played on. I think this would be really interesting. I found this interesting, and I hope that you do. If you do find it interesting, please hit the like button. And if you want to see more like tanking POV and how to tank Kara, as well as how to DPS Kara, SSE, TK, and so on, all in a pre nerf state. So these videos, uh, my goal is to give you a really good understanding of what to expect and how to perform the best when it comes to TBC Classic launch. So to start off with, as a priest you want to be fear warding somebody most likely the tank as soon as you enter the dungeon you basically want to start getting your fear ward on, on cooldown so you can use another one as a shaman you want to be tremor toteming so that any fears that your group does get it'll be broken because of the tremor and you can also shackle as a priest if needed to cc some of the trash it's the charges which will charge range members and then immediately do a fear so you can somewhat predict the fear and you want to avoid it as much as possible. As a druid healer here, you want to focus on decursing. The curse reduces your chance to hit by 50%. It's not needed on healers, but on the tank, it is the absolute biggest priority here. Threat can be a real issue on this boss and with a curse reducing the tank's chance to hit, it can get very, very bad. So do the main tank first, then the off tank, and then DPS one by one, and ignore decursing the healers. There are also several threat resets that you need to be mindful for. You don't want to be casting a big heal on these transitions. A Tumen, the Huntsman, will spawn. You do not want to be um, pulling aggro as soon as he spawns. You want to let the tank have at least a global to pick him up. Just be mindful. That happens when Midnight's 95% HP. And then when Midnight and Attunement are going to come together in the final phase, this is another threat sensitive area where it's a threat reset. Again, do not cast big heals during this time because the tank can struggle to pick up aggro. The biggest factor when wanting success with this boss is threat. You can also Bloodlust and Heroism the tank just to ensure that they have the threat they need in order to tank the boss successfully. You should also assign healers, one for the tank on Midnight and one for the tank on Achuman. Now we're on the trash on our way to the next boss who is Morose. There's going to be a curse that you get in this room. You do not need to worry about dispelling it. It doesn't do that much damage and you can easily heal through it. It's not worth the globals. Also another note about threat. You just want to be careful that you're not pulling threat if you don't happen to have a paladin tank. The AoE tanking capability of a paladin is huge and if you're running with double warrior or warrior druid be mindful that you will likely have aggro at some point during this trash. Be ready to fade, bear form, you know, slow totem and just try and stay alive. Your life is important. With these retainer packs, if you're a Resto Shaman, you can purge the Spectral Retainer. The Spectral Retainer gets a hot, and the Spectral Retainer also does a mind control. So this is why we want to kill the Spectral Retainer first. If you're a Resto Druid, be ready to Cyclone. If you're a Priest, you could fear the mind control and just generally stay alive when your friends are trying to kill you when they're mind controlled. Obviously, there's a lot of AoE going out here, and you might want to Blessing of Protection your Mages and your Warlocks if they're going to be pulling aggro. Next up, we have the Phantom Valet. Now, to put things into perspective, the Phantom Valet hits as hard as Nightbane, largely considered the hardest boss in Karazhan. So be warned, the tank should be calling that they're pulling a Phantom Valet. You need to pre-hot, you need to pre-cast, you need to pump everything you have into the tank because he's going to be taking some insane damage from the phantom valet 
Next up, we have these skeletal waiters. Now, you need to react whenever a skeletal waiter is pulled. You want to be standing on top in melee range because what the skeletal waiter will do is find one random player in melee and give them the Brittle Bones debuff for two minutes. This will periodically reduce your armor to zero. You do not want this to be on your tanks. And if you do happen to get this debuff on the tanks, you could potentially just have a two minute break because it's very scary when your tanks get the Brittle bones debuff reducing their armor to zero and it also turns them into a skeleton next up we've got some more difficult trash namely the ghostly stewards these are some of the hardest hitting mobs in the game um, relative to what your gear is at least these mobs at 50 percent have an enrage increasing their damage and they also stun the tank these are taunt immune and cc immune so if one tank dies this mob can very easily walk around the room just one shotting everyone until it's a wipe you need to be starting the pull with a full mana bar and just pumping your max rank heals into the tanks this is a very critical point for healers in kara so here we are at the second boss morose this is mostly about the pickup as it's a council style fight with multiple npcs you need to make sure that the tanks pick everything up safely while CC is used on the pull and maintained for either the fight's duration or until the boss is controlled and you can just kill the extra CC dads. If you're the priest, you need to ensure your shackle is going off right as the pull happens to keep it away from any cleaving or consecration that your party may be doing. You can also consider precasting a second shackle if you are scared that your first shackle could get resisted. You also want to be shielding and hotting both tanks on the pull. There can be quite a lot of damage on the tanks at the start. You also want to be dispelling the debuffs which you will get on the tank, most notably the Hammer of Justice stun. Debuffs to take note of are the Blind, which is a removable poison, and also the Garrot, which is a bleed, which if you're a Holy Paladin, you may want to keep this debuff on because a simple life bloom will keep you alive and the additional healing you'll receive replenishes your mana as a paladin so that can be quite nice you can also blessing of protection the bleed off any raid member don't forget to re-bless them after the bot has ended this is by far the hardest fight of the first half of kara and as such don't be too disheartened if you do wipe a couple of times it's quite a long fight the key things to remember are the cc and the dispelling now in this particular raid they go back and kill the animal boss the animal boss is accessed if you turn right as soon as you enter the door at the entrance of karazan right at the beginning you'll be greeted by these spiders which do an aoe volley for nature damage the volley can be interrupted and stunned to make sure that your raid healing and dropping poison cleanse totem as well as as druid getting rid of the poison on the raid as well to make sure that everyone's healed up it's quite easy and then you'll find yourself at one of three random bosses you have the spider boss which drops a belt which is which has a random enchant so it's either cloth leather plate um, or male and they have a, like i say a random enchant so this could be of the boar of the spider of the bear these sort of things as well as nature resistance or shadow resistance or sp fire damage or shadow damage so some of these can be best in slot for example a survival hunter might be really interested in the agility items or if you're wanting to have um, nature resistance for hydros that can be really good as well as a druid or someone who's very interested in just the epics and the high armor that those epics have the bosses themselves are very straightforward you've got the dog which is just tank and spank which drops the wrists and then the bat which drops boots with an aoe silence a charge a wing buffet and a knockback you can just taunt him back when the silence fades it's fairly straightforward and it's often skipped because the loot isn't that amazing but it can potentially be best in slot i think in tbc classic we'll see every group killing the animal boss just for the small chance of best in slot loot next up we're on our way to maiden we have these packs of four mobs with a concubine which is a demon which should be banished we also have wanton hostesses which are undead and therefore should be shackled the concubines do a cc in the form of a seduction which, which lasts six seconds you can preemptively stun the concubines to try and avoid them doing the seduction and the wanton hostesses have an aoe silence 
As a healer, you definitely want to be max range to avoid the silence, as well as their bewitching aura, which reduces magic damage by 50%, as well as their alluring aura, reducing physical damage by 50%. Ensure that your shackles are maintained and if they are not, make sure that you're healing whoever has aggro and shielding them if the tanks are slow to pick them up. You definitely want to be using CC here to have a straightforward and smooth run. Five, so here we are four, on Maiden. Three, you need two, to be very aware that one, your dispel range two. is not the same range as your healing range. You want to make sure that everybody in the raid is within a dispeller and their dispel range. So you can kind of assign that before the pull. You can run around the outside of the room as well to indicate whereabouts you're going to be for the pull. So you want to be as close to the consecration as you can, more or less, whilst not being close enough to each other that you're going to spread the... It's like, like I always describe it as being like a chain lightning, but instead of nature damage, it's holy damage, and it d deals more damage the more people it ch chains to. So you can see how we're spread here. So this is how you want to spread in range of the dispels, but not stood any closer. So here you see the repentance goes out. Ideally, you would jump into the Consecration to take a tick of the Consecration to um, break the Repentance, but it's not strictly necessary. You can just hot and the tank can use cooldowns as well. The tank can also move the boss spamming Consecration towards a healer getting Repented and the Consecration will tick and break the Repentance. As a Holy Paladin, Blessing of Sacrifice is huge. You can drop this on anybody who's in melee and the tick of damage from the Sacrifice will instantly break your Repentance. You need to be dispelling people with the Holy Fire very quickly. Um, the Holy Fire does moderate damage initially but ticks for a lot or it does a lot of damage that puts you low HP and then it ticks slowly but you're still going to die. So just focus on getting the Dispel quickly off on the Holy Fire target. You could also consider using PvP Trinket here as well for the Repentance. If you want to share anything with your guild, it's probably this trash skip. So the Paladin jumps through, bubbles, pulls the patrol. You need to make sure that the patrol is close. So you're pulling five mobs in total. Two pairs, which are just standard static mobs, and then a patrol. The paladin runs to the left, the rest of the raid runs to the right. There's not much more to say than that. The paladin dies, the rest of the raid is out of combat, and you summon the paladin when they run into the start of the dungeon, having uh, rezzed at the entrance. If you're not doing this paladin bubble skip or an invis pot skip, you want to be using your grounding totems early. Make sure you have ideally your tanks in two different groups, ideally with two different shamans and grounding totem early. So you can pop down the grounding totem next because the tanks get ice tombed and then the ta the mobs start attacking anyone they like. And the mobs do a fairly, fairly good amount of uh, damage. So you do need to be careful of that as well. The old school meta for pulling mobs in this room is that you pull them downstairs so that you're able to have more space. You can see this is the final pack in this area. And as you can see, like Adal's trying to find himself some more space. What you um, want to be mindful is that when these spectral performers die, they do AoE damage. They also summon these columns of light, which increase damage by, I think, 50% off the top of my head. This also increases their damage done. So when they're doing their AoE damage, when they die, this is amplified by 50%. So you, it can lead to people dying. Again, if you feel like you don't have enough room in this area, bring the mobs downstairs. This room has maybe four or five mobs total, um, which is why you pull them down. And then this was just the last pack where we happened to have some fatalities. The first mobs in this area also have a dispellable debuff on the tanks which CCs them. This needs to be dispelled as soon as possible because the mob will run on the second on threat whilst the tank is CC'd. Additionally, the second half of this area, the mobs will do a net trap on the mob, on the tank. This needs to either be fapped or blessing of freedom by Paladin. So this is the Dorothy encounter for Opera. We'll go through all three, but on the screen it's the Dorothy encounter. So as a shaman, you want to be flame striking straw man. Any kind of fire spell that anyone can do on the straw man have a chance for him to have like a disorient effect, similar to the mage's dragon breath. 
So just keep spamming fire abilities on him and he can basically be CC'd or a chance to be CC'd. So it's not 100%, um, but if enough people are using fire spells, it more or less is. So as a shaman, that's kind of your role to just make sure that mob is CC'd. Um, healing cooldowns need to be used early because it's uh, lots of mobs at the start, similar to Morose, and you kill them off one by one. The pickup slash pull is everything make sure that people know what they're uh, healing and what they're tanking and who's assigned to what soon after the fight starts there'll also be raw which is a little dog which does a fear so be mindful for that and pre-cast fear ward and uh, tremor totem and then in phase two we have a non-tankable witch which does a cyclone ability or it's like a tornado ability that wa walks itself around the room and you get thrown up in the air effectively being cc'd if you get hit by it you can just stand behind it and hopefully it won't backtrack on itself it also might be focusing a specific player so if you can identify either of those things and just avoid it ultimately um, we've also got the other um, opera bosses we've got Romulo and Julianne you fight one of them first and then the other one and then you fight them both at once what you want to do is purge might it's a might buff that Romulo has which increases his damage significantly so dispel that ASAP Romulo also does quite a lot of damage even without this attack power buff so really um, the strongest healers need to be on the Romulo tank and Julianne has a heal which needs to be interrupted by the shaman or anybody else who can heal. The heal is called Eternal Attraction. And then the last opera boss is Big Bad Wolf where you want to fear ward the tank and tremor down early. And then just kite if you're being targeted yourself and you can spam heals on whoever is currently kiting. You also want to be mindful of a threat change after the kiting phase. Um, on private servers at least this is not always a uh, immune to threat phase so if, he, uh, if dps's are still going ham on the boss whilst it's being kited the tank is going to struggle to get threat back so be prepared to heal them or blessing or protection them moving on to the trash straight after opera we have philanthropists which are elites and then a load of lesser mobs which are not elites the philanthropists are taunt immune so just be careful that um, just be ready to heal people who aren't the tanks if they lose threat. The philanthropists do a cast, um, it deals a bit of damage and if it's cast on the same person twice then it becomes deadly so make sure you top up the raid quickly. These trapped soul mobs deal a lot of damage as well as a frontal cone cone of cold effect. You need to be pre-casting on these packs. We are now near the back door of Kara if you want a reference point and we're um, close to Nightbane. Uh, these mobs also do a curse which reduces your chance to hit. Make sure it's decursed very very quickly. The tank is running ahead ensure that you are in line of sight to heal them again these ghost mobs after the back entrance of kara deal a lot of damage it is a noticeable step up in damage from this point forward these watchmen require one tank each you need to make sure that you have assigned healers one healer per tank and there's also going to be an arcane debuff which deals a little bit of damage at the beginning and then more and more damage as the debuff uh, remains on the target. It's not dispellable and you need to run away from the raid as it occurs. You can see Adal has the debuff. You run immediately away from the raid. As long as you receive a little bit of healing you will survive. It doesn't typically do your whole, it only just does more than your whole health bar. So just a little bit of healing will be enough but make sure you aren't stacking this ability with anything else. Move away from the raid when you get this debuff. Next we are pulling mobs out of curator's room. We have the Anomaly, which deals a lot of damage. And we also have these little Siphoners, which deal a very small amount of damage in comparison. The Siphoners are non-elite, and the big guy is an elite. The big guy is immune to damage, but you instead remove his mana bar, which kills him. Um, and the Siphoners just have their HP. The Siphoners restore a little bit of mana when they die. But generally, uh, because the big guy deals a lot of damage, you want to kill him first. AoE is typically just AoE, and the solo people just go for the big guy. The Siphoners also have a mana drain, which can be spam dispelled to interrupt. It's better if a priest does this with multiple dispels at once. 
Um, Prev Mending is really big on the pull here because the boss takes um, has a buff, reducing its damage taken significantly. So healing threat is a real big deal here. So Prayer of Mending on the tank means that the tank is getting threat from the heal. So that's really good to build threat initially. Be careful of healing threat on the pull, as well as any DPS uh, threat done as well. Make sure that everyone is in range of a healer. Healers will typically be at the back of the raid as not to get pushback from the sparks that spawn. As a shaman, you want to time your bloodless. Just as the boss does his evocate, he evocates when his mana bar reaches zero. Save your shadow fiend for the evocation. The boss takes additional damage when he's evocating. You will get so much mana back during the evocate with your shadow fiend because the mana regen from shadow fiend is based on the damage the shadow fiend deals. As a paladin, if you can, you want to be saving your wings for the evocation to deal damage as well. There's no damage going out as long as you've killed all the sparks. You want to use righteousness, uh, seal of righteousness and deal damage as well. Throughout the fight, excluding the evocate damage phase, the boss does a hateful strike on the second person on threat. You need to identify who this person is and heal them accordingly. If they're taking uh, astral flare damage, which are the sparks, as well as significant damage from the hateful, they could be potentially killed. It's ideal if it's a ranged person taking hateful strikes so they can outrange the, the sparks and just get healed and just take damage from the hatefuls. Concentration Aura from a Paladin can be very big here um, as it means that it gives you the option to stack behind the boss not having to spread so the melee can have full up time and cleave the boss and the sparks. This can also be a very very mana intensive fight so mana pot early as well and any MP5 gear can really go a long way. After the, the curator dies the next room is really difficult and very annoying. Well it's not that difficult but it's very annoying. So these are like little mini curators. They have similar effects. They're doing like a spell reflect ability thing. So when spellcasters attack they're getting a portion of their damage um, reflected back to them. So heal the raid. They also have a charged fists or something ability that will be a cast i think or a buff at least and this does significant damage on the tank um, they also move at a reduced speed so you can kite the mob or pop avoidance trinkets etc but be careful when um these protectors get the buff for increased damage as well as like you saw the uh, spell reflect there's also a, a physical attack reflect which will attack your melees more annoying trash now so the big guys can be only well can be attacked by physical and spell damage and the small guys the mana feeders are immune to all magic damage so it has to be physical to kill the mana feeders so obviously any physical go immediately on the mana feeders or else you'll be here for ages the mana feeders have a surprising amount of hp they also do like a focus drop threat mechanic so they're not always going to be attacking the tank and now shortly before Ilhoof, we have Magical Horrors, which need to be killed first. They do a volley ability, so get ready to uh, raid heal. And then you have the smaller mobs, which do a large AoE when they die. Uh, in order to avoid this AoE, you want to stun them. So this is when a Holy Paladin can come in handy for the stun. Otherwise, you're just raid healing. You do not want to kill these two mobs at the same time. If you do, there's going to be a huge amount of um, raid damage if neither of them are stunned. We now have Spell Shades, which as a Rest of Shaman, you can interrupt to bring it into melee of the tank. They can also be lost. Uh, just bring them into the tank. There's a little skip here you can do uh, to try and um, avoid pulling an extra pack. These Spell Shades are just going to be casting volleys a lot of the time. So you just need to be ready to heal the raid. You can see that they are lost at the top of the ramp here, so melee can attack all of them at once. As a resto shaman, you can of course be interrupting this and dropping groundings. Now we are on Five, Ilhoof, where four, Chain Heal comes three, into play two, very nicely. One, Let's just talk about positioning quickly. We basically want to stand where Ilhoof is when before we pull. You want to be standing close to the three portals. The reason that you want the whole raid to be near the portals is because People in the raid will get aggro of the adds and the best way to deal with the adds is to just kill them and the warlocks need to be seed of corruption and aoeing them all at once and if you just have everyone in the raid stacking near the boss 
the adds will be near the boss regardless of who they're attacking and they just get AoE that much quicker in one big pile. Like I say, Chain Heal is really useful here just to heal the whole raid. Again, because we are stacking, it's nice. You can Paladin bubble the sacrifice. So throughout the fight, the boss will teleport a random raid member to this green circle on the floor where you are you can't do anything, you're CC'd, and the rest of the raid needs to damage the chains to release you from your CC. You do take damage during this chain CC, so heal accordingly. And priests want to be using their shields on the warlocks so they can tap more aggressively to do more Seed of Corruption to AoE the imps. On this video, there are very few imps just because the Seed of Corruptions are so effective. Now we are on Shade of Aran. Don't stand close to the boss because he does an AoE silence. Always stay at range. The shaman can try and kick some of the casts the boss does. This will be pre-assigned before the pull. You can lust during flame wrath as you just stand and attack the boss because there's a blizzard going out now so he'll do one of three abilities i won't get into the tactics but when there's fire circles around people that's the best time to lust earth shield on another healer to help protect them you can lost the elementals the boss spawns elementals at 40 percent you can lost them if you don't want them to be directly attacking you loss it towards another elemental because then a tank can pick up two at the same time without having to run around you don't need salvation here because there's no threat apart from on the elementals. Using the target of target frame is very good here because the boss will cast an arcane barrage a third of the time is one of his spells. And being able to target his target or like a mouse over his target of target is really good for just healing them whilst they're getting hit by arcane barrage. Mass dispel can be very useful for when the boss uh, teleports everyone into the middle of the room he's going to then cast an arcane explosion you are slown it is possible for everyone in the raid to just walk to the outside of the room to outrange the arcane explosion that's what you should do however as a priest if you have enough mana it's not that mana inten intensive but if you are struggling don't bother master spelling however if you do have enough mana you can master spell it will dispel everyone and then you run at full movement speed away to the edge of the room to avoid the arcane explosion as a priest, binding heal is very useful here, so you can just keep people alive whilst not worrying about you dying. You can dispel the Chains of Ice. This is similar to the Death Knight ability in Wrath of the Lich King. It looks like a, a ice chain effect on somebody. This should be dispelled. Um, he does this potentially when the blizzard is around, and if anyone's stuck in the blizzard, they're going to be taking huge amounts of damage. You can see here we've hit 40%. We have Warlocks Banishing. Um, there is, like I say, threat. There's a threat table on these elementals. The tanks will try and pick them up, but be mindful that healing threat is going to have all of the um, the elementals attacking a healer to start with. So be cautious there. And if you're using like binding heal or health stones, you know, use them now when the elementals have spawned. This is also when you tend to uh, lust if you didn't lust earlier on. Personally, I like lusting. 40% uh, HP because um, like it's more hectic during this part of the fight similar to uh, the last phase in Kalthazad. Wouldn't rely on this image but supposedly on retail there was a safe zone so you see that the first circle is where you can be counterspelled, the outer area is where you will be hit by the blizzard and the the not pink and the not white area will be supposedly a safe zone. Don't rely on this. After Shade, we have some more Shades. You want to be max ranging them. As you see here, they do a volley. You kill the mobs that volley first, and then you just kill the other mobs, which are easy. It's important to max range these mobs. We're going to be doing another Paladin skip here. You can see the Paladin goes first, gets in combat, pulls all the mobs, and then runs to the right. The rest of the raid is running on the left. The Paladin then tanks them until his immunity fades, and then he dies. The mobs then reset whilst the rest of the raid has already run through you can then as the paladin run into the dungeon or get a res and then summon if you aren't using a paladin skip and you're killing these mobs one by one make sure first of all that you are pulling them one by one because these are some pretty tough mobs they do a disarm which is avoidable you can use a avoidance trinket to time it when they're doing the disarm to avoid the threat drop if you are disarmed you'll get the threat drop these mobs are immune to taunt and you will struggle to pick them back up as a tank. So make sure that the whole raid at range is at max range. So you can heal and kill before the raid wipes. 
So now we are on Nether Spite, which is normally one of the last bosses you do, but we're doing it earlier on this run apparently. So you need to heal quite a lot because there are no beams active. The, the, the boss does quite a bit of damage um, until the tank then takes a red beam. You no longer, you no longer need to heal the tank. I'll stress this again. Do not heal the tank when there is a red beam active. You can put some hots on him as a resto druid, but whenever he goes back into the red beam, he's going to be healed to full. Do not worry about the main tank. The green beam will bring your mana to full. So if you're ever low on mana, you can just drop into the green beam and you'll be replenished to maximum mana. You just want to take a single tick of the green beam because it reduces your mana pool the longer you stay in the green beam. The players in the blue beam will be dealing extra damage to the boss, but also receiving extra damage. So be mindful to heal them. You will only be able to take one of each beam once every two uh, phase transitions. So now we're transitioning into the first of the shadow phases. You want to be spread 360 around the boss. The boss will target somebody and do a breath. The breath target wants to stay still. It is the responsibility of everyone else to move away from the target of the breath. You can heal the person instantly when they get targeted by the breath. There is a threat reset at the end of the banish phase. Banish phase is ending in one second. Again, there is no red beam. The tank will need to be healed. The tank also wants to be using cooldowns when there's not a red beam because the boss does hit quite hard. Again, the tank will heal himself to full HP every time he goes into a new red beam. So he just runs in and out to keep healing himself to full. Of course, don't stand in the void zones. And again, um, you can see Adal here under his map or near his map. He has the green debuff still for 30 seconds. When this runs out, he is okay to go back into the green beam and that will again replenish his mana to full. This is the second um, normal phase, the, the, the second phase one. So you still have the debuff if you took a beam in phase one, in the, the beam phase. So the next beam phase, which will be beam phase, the third beam phase, um, he'll be able to take the beam, the green beam once more for one tick. Uh, also as a druid you want to be life blooming the entire raid as there is a uh, shadow AoE or a damage ticking on the whole raid throughout the fight. You want to be pre-healing every time there's a, a phase change, uh, the threat wipe and again no red beam for the tank to uh, bring his own life back to full. As a paladin you really want to be judging light, it's so good to counteract the shadow damage aura going on um, the trash before chess there is a um a dispellable uh, debuff which heals um the npc back okay so here we're back on chess um as the healer you have a damaging spell and a healing spell you want to be using your healing spell basically on the friendly king on cooldown and then your damage spell when that's off cooldown so the priority is to heal and then the damage is the second priority again you basically just spam healing the friendly king you can also heal the other healer if they're in trouble as well the trash before prince can hit very hard so make sure you're drinking to full and spamming max rank heals hard because they're taunt immune and also hard because they've hit very hard you want to pre-shield um, prayer of mending pre-cast everything you can don't worry so much about pulling threat as a healer here because the mobs literally hit so hard the tank's going to have lots and lots of threat and rage straight away it's really just spam your whole mana bar to keep the tanks alive these mobs do a thrash and they can be very scary they also do a cleave so just be mindful and just call for a mana break after every single uh, pack of these mobs if you need to another word of warning is if you wipe here the run back is massive so ensure that you have soul stones running and you have like di ready because it's like a five minute run back every wipe from this point this is a bit of a meme but don't fall down this stairway because you don't want to delay the, the raid like the tank will be wanting to pull the mobs at the top of the staircase and you don't just want to be stood here waiting ages for people to uh, be following uh, this mob is the last mob before what people mostly consider the last boss so again make sure you're pre-healing before this mob you could also buff here and save raid ready for the last boss so here we are on prince malkazar you want to be pre-healing on the pull you want to be getting the armor buff on the tank as well on the pull which is ideal 
the, the, the if there's a hunter, it'll be MD'd. Hopefully your tank has the engineering trinket as well to pull. You want to have your MP5 gear on here. It's a potential very long fight. You don't want to dispel the tank in phase one. It'll be the only thing to dispel in phase one um, because you want to have the tank do as much threat as they can to start with. You want to also be saving mana in phase one. Again, this can be a very lengthy fight. You do want to be potioning early for mana. You can also dark rune, but don't dark rune until after an enfeeble. This is when the whole raid goes to 1 HP. You will kill yourself if you do use dark rune or seal of blood or shadow word death, these sort of effects. At 60%, the boss reaches phase 2, where the boss now dual wields and has a thrash ability. You want to be spamming non stop on the tank. No renews, just hard spam greater heal until phase 2 ends. The tank can take huge amounts of damage and can practically go from full HP to dead in an instant. The tank needs to be topped the entire time. Agility Totem is also big for increasing the avoidance of the tank in phase 2. Phase 2 ends when the boss reaches 30% HP. This is when you want to be dispelling the entire raid of the dot. Again in phase 3 there will be axes running around the room attacking a random raid member. You need to identify which raid member this is and make sure they are healed. The tank is taking again significantly less damage in phase 1 and phase 3. Phase 2 is really when you need to be spamming the tank. Phase 3 in contrast is much less damage on the tank however in phase 3 you have much more of these elementals spawning. These elementals as you can see are pulsating fire damage. You want to be making sure you obviously are not standing in these. You want to be moving as a collective raid group away from these uh, infernals is what they're called. Last up we have Nightbane. Now this is a very very long fight. Very tricky. Make sure you've got your MP5 gear on here and plenty of mana potions. You want to also be tiding early. You want to be shadow fiending after the charred earth. The charred earth being the circle of fire damage on the floor. You also want to be fiending before the mana potion. Make sure that tremor totem is down for all of your group and is in range. As you see this is now a tank perspective. Um, when there's a charred earth on the tank position here I will run through the boss and be tanking him where his tail is now. Um, there's a circular platform that we're killing the boss on. Make sure that the tank isn't line of sighting you when the tank moves from this side of the platform to the other side again where the tail is. You need to be still on the outside of this ring that we're standing in to avoid being line of sighted. If you're three healing this boss, which I would recommend in the early stages, you want to have one healer outranging the fear. The fear is outrangeable. If you don't have a warrior tank stance dancing the fears, you want to ensure that you have the fear wards ready. And if you're having to rely on tremor totem, ensure that the entire raid is getting feared. If one person isn't feared, the boss will ignore the nine people feared and run and attack that individual not feared. So you need to ensure that everyone is feared. Again, only when using um, Tremor Totem. Every 25% he will transition and fly up into the air. You need to be very, very, very um, aware of who gets the Reign of Bones debuff. It's the first debuff you see here. I don't have it showing on my grid, my raid unit frames, but you should do as a healer for sure. Once it's identified who has the Reign of Bones debuff, you stay in for two um, spawns of the adds and then you walk to the range camp. The tanks then pick up these skeletons. You want to be dispelling um, everybody when you can as the priest healer. And you want to be spamming all of your heals into the tanks here. This is very um, healer intensive. Um, to be honest, the ground phase is also healer intensive, but this particularly so. If you're able to kill the skeletons quickly and you have a few seconds before the boss lands, use this as mana regeneration time. Also, as the priest, you can be using your fear ward every time you clear the adds because as soon as the boss lands, Two seconds later, he will cast a fear, at least on this private server. So you might as well on um, 
on classic uh, classic tbc again the the boss does a fair amount of damage so don't be caught out by not pre-casting and uh, not pre-shielding prayer of mending etc or trying to uh, get a armor buff on the tank again you'll just do another air phase which is scary um it's about saving mana and not letting people die when the ads spawn in the air phase and that's about it. That's Kara from a healer point of view. If you enjoyed the video, please like and subscribe. You can catch me on my Twitch streams linked in the description. A huge shout out to Adal for helping me with this video. I learned a lot from it, having done Kara so many times previously, and I hope that some of the tips and tricks from him have been useful. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll catch you guys later. Bye.